<laughs> oh, one of my favorite movies of all times. And it's appropriate that we show that scene as today we head into those miserable Psalms. So depressing. We are looking throughout this series at passages in the Old Testament that are representative of how Jesus tells us to read the entire Old Testament as really about himself. He, he actually changes our filter so we see different things. I'm learning about filters. Friend got me on Instagram. My goodness. I know what you're saying. You're saying, Bruxy, that face doesn't need a filter. I realize. <laughs> I'm, but I can make myself look even more sexy than this. I'm just now looking for the skinny filter and we'll be good to go. Uh, and then my daughter got me on, uh, what is it, Snapchat, and I just wanna say thank you to all of you who have befriended me and have sent me pictures that update me about you know, what you had for breakfast and some of those exciting things. I look forward to your next update with interest. Um, <laughs> I still haven't quite figured out how they, what these things are for. And by the way, those of you who have sent me messages on Snapchat, I haven't responded because I haven't figured out how to send a picture, but I, your, your updates are, are changing my life. I'll also mention though, when it comes to filters, the beautiful thing about the Jesus filter is that it, it, it sends us in the Old Testament not in a way that makes it more rosy than it is or makes it appear more beautiful than it actually is, the Jesus filter does make the Bible more beautiful, but by tuning us into reality better. Jesus says when you read the Old Testament with him at the center, you're actually seeing more clearly what it's always been about. The Jesus filter helps you see better, clearer, and allows you to see details that you just didn't notice before Jesus taught us how to read our Bible. And when we do that, we find out that, yes, there's passages in the Old Testament that are about prophecy, specific prophecies, we could say, about Jesus. Uh, last week, we looked at the seed of Eve and Abraham. Uh, later on in this series, we'll talk about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, prophecies of the anointed king who is coming. Uh, we, we see specific prophecies, yes, but the Jesus filter helps us see a whole lot more than that, as we learned last week. We also <clears throat> see Jesus in stories. So Abraham and Isaac isn't a specific uh, prophecy, but as we read the story, we realize that God's heart, the heart of Christ is in this. We learn about God the Father and, and Abraham willing to sacrifice Isaac. We learn about the, the obedience of the Son, but we also learn about Jesus as the substitute sacrifice through the ram that is given. The story of the Exodus out of Egypt is a, a, a beautiful portrayal of the freedom Jesus gives us from the bondage of sin. Uh, even Jonah and the great fish, when we read that, there's nothing in that that says this is a prophecy about the Messiah, but then Jesus says, that's the sign, by the way, that I'm gonna give you. The only sign you're really gonna get is the sign of Jonah, for three days I'll be buried and I'll rise again, like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. So we learned last week that as we read through the scriptures, since Jesus and the whole Christ event, God coming in human form and sharing his love with us and then being rejected, dying, rising again, was something that even as God was creating the world, he had in mind. So every bit of history has actually, actually got that in mind as it unfolds. We can read the Bible a whole new way. Uh, then we can see Jesus in characters. He is called the second Adam. He is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, that mysterious Old Testament figure. He is a prophet like Moses, says Moses. Um, and he is very often identified with, uh, with someone who is in the line of King David. Um, <clears throat> also we see Jesus in even the holidays of Israel. We see him in the Passover, he is the Passover lamb. Uh, we see him in Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, and that day happens on Good Friday once and for, once and for all. Jubilee, the year of Jubilee, the freedom that we have in Christ is something that we're celebrated through what he achieves. And these are just examples. Uh, we see him in the systems of sacrifice, the systems of priests, of temple and tabernacle, governmental systems, all the systems of Israel we see prefiguring Jesus. It also um, gives us an opportunity to see Jesus sometimes in person. Jesus, the word of God is present at creation as we talked about last week. God speaks things into existence. The entire trinity involved there. The angel of the Lord fascinating enigmatic figure in the Old Testament who is somehow distinct from Yahweh and yet speaks for Yahweh and has the voice of Yahweh. <clears throat> and then it does raise one final question. What about the violence of the Old Testament? Do we see Jesus there? 
Right from the beginning in this series, that was one of the questions many of you asked, is what do we do with Jesus and Old Testament violence? Oh, it's actually a question people are asking all the time, and it's certainly one that theologians have wrestled with on and off. Theologians throughout history have come up with different theories, could be dozens of theories on how we reconcile, because if we see that God is very much like Jesus, and Jesus shows us what God is like, and he loves his enemies, then then what do you do with the God who commands violence in the Old Testament? Now, if you're not for the Jesus bit, you really don't have a contradiction. You just, uh, you just assume, yeah, God, God can be violent. The, the challenge comes if you add the Jesus bit on and say, well, this doesn't seem like the same heart here back and forth. There's been different ways that Christians have approached this. Uh, let me take the many theories and try and parse them out into three categories of theories, really. We'll say three theories, but these are really three categories of theories. theories. First of all, God is glorified through whatever he does, including violence. Uh, God is a God of violence as well as a God of peace. This gives us Old and New Testament, his peaceful side and his violent side gives us a fully orbed understanding of the heart of God. This has been the primary theory of the church uh, for hundreds of years and probably is a dominant theory within most of the church today, Protestant and Catholic. Anabaptists, start with Jesus and then radiate out from there. So some would say, ah, no, God is garbled in the Old Testament, not glorified. In other words, God is like Jesus and he's so much like Jesus that therefore Israel is mistaken. They have to be. When Israel says God's told us to go and slaughter the Canaanites, they can't have heard God clearly. His message must have been garbled because if God is really like Jesus, How could that be the case? So there is, just so you know, this is um, in current theological practice, there is a stream of of, uh, theological thinking, much of it coming from the Anabaptist wing of the Christian church, that starting with Jesus, as God's like Jesus says, then we have to admit that the Old Testament is off as far as even hearing the voice of God. The scriptures are inspired, and the scriptures are giving us an opportunity to see how people get God wrong. Like when you read the Psalms, uh, not everything in the Psalm is a teaching of how God feels. Some things in the Psalm are just a reflection of how David feels as he prays the Psalms, as he works them out, as he calls out to God. It doesn't mean that it reflects God's heart in every instance, it reflects David's heart. And that's, <clears throat> that's what scripture sometimes does. It accurately reflects the human experience. And maybe the scriptures where the prophets say, God has said go and slaughter, our enemies are reflecting a human understanding at that time. There is a third option, if that pushes it too far from you, within Anabaptist circles, yes, God is like Jesus, therefore God is grieving. The Old Testament scriptures can be taken at face value when God says to go and slaughter, it is God speaking. But he does this grievously because he's accommodating their institutions, our institutions. This principle of accommodation is something we do know is true for God. We see that in other areas, so, we're, so many theologians wonder, can we apply that to the area of Old Testament violence? Uh, for instance, God says clearly in Scripture he doesn't want a temple to be built for him. He commanded a tabernacle, a tent, but not a temple. It was King David who came up with the idea. David said, hey, I live in a palace, other kings live in a palace, you're the king of kings and lord of lords, you need a palace, we're gonna build you a big temple. God says, I don't want a temple. David says, you're getting a temple. God says, no temple, you're getting a temple. And, and you, I've said this before, God says, a tabernacle's fine for me, I just like a tent, I'm more of an outdoorsy deity. <laughs> You know, I, I just let's do some camping. It's portable. I like that. David says, no, you're getting a temple. And then God says, all right, all right, we'll go to the temple. And I'll give you some instructions on how to build it. I'll tell you who's going to build it. You're not. Your son is. I'll show up and bless it with my Shekinah glory. And we will use temple. Jesus finally shows up then with zeal for the temple. My father's house shall be a house of prayer, he says. You've turned it into a den of thieves. He cares about the temple. So that's fascinating because God never wanted a temple in the first place. But once God says yes, he does wholeheartedly throw himself into that and he cares. Same thing with kings, very clear. First Samuel 8, Israel says we want a king. God says I don't want you to have a king, I'm your king. You can have prophets and judges, but when it comes to the office of king, just one, that's me, king. Israel says we want a king, a human king like other nations. God says no king, I'm your king. Israel says we want a king, we want a king. 
And Samuel, the prophet, says, what do I do? God says, all right, give him a king. And Samuel says, are they rejecting my leadership? God says, no, they're rejecting me. When Israel wants a king, they're rejecting me. That's how personally I take this. God couldn't have been more opposed to Israel having a king. But what's interesting is he accommodates, not passively, but actively. God, God does not say, all right, you want a temple, build a temple. You want a king, all right, have your king. But I'll tell you this, I'll have no part of this. I'll have no part of it. I'll sit over here and, and just watch you get yourselves into trouble and say, I told you so. God is not a pouty poopy pants. When he says, okay, you can have a king, what does he do? He dives right in. He doesn't give up on Israel and says, in fact, I will, I will tell you who to anoint as the first king, and then the second king, David, and then I will use David as a prefiguring of Christ eventually coming and Jesus being a king, and I will guide you through the whole kingly process. You see, if you were to dive into that process halfway through, you would think God is really into kings. He loves kings. He's really involved with kings, or he really seems to like the temple. I mean, look at Jesus. He's so zealous for the temple. God's into temples. But when you go back to the beginning, you realize, no, no, this is God accommodating the fact that once he makes beings in his image and in his likeness, he is committed to this process of partnership, and he uses it actively. I think we can build a case for the entire sacrificial system being exactly the same thing. The principle of accommodation worked out. Not God's initial desire or design, but him working with them and saying, okay, you want sacrifices? I will inspire you to write Leviticus. Oh, baby. And he works with them, and he uses it to point toward the coming of Christ. And so some would say, even the warfare in the Old Testament, yes, God is involved in it, he is commanding it, but this is him already accommodating the warring impulses of the day and saying, how can I use this to work out my punishment, to work out my blessing, to work out history, God accommodating, but he does so saying, this is not my heart, just like kings were not his heart, the temple was not his heart. Killing animals so you can get forgiveness. That's not the heart of God. It is something God has used, God has been behind for a season, but he grieved his way through it. Now this is rooted in our understanding of John 1.18 and other passages of scripture that say something fascinating. Say, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. The first and the last sentence fascinates me the most, or part of the sentence. No one has ever seen God. Now when John writes this, he understands that there are many theophanies in the Old Testament, appearances of God. He walks and talks with Adam and Eve in the garden, he, uh, if Moses is said to have talked with God as one talks face to face. He appears to all of Israel as a pure, pure, p- pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He appears to Moses as a burning bush. Uh, Ezekiel sees him as a wheel within a wheel. I mean, God is constantly appearing. People have seen God. Haven't they seen God? I think people have seen God. And no, John knows all of this. He has a very acute understanding of Old Testament scripture. But, so he's making this very conscious statement when he says, no, 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 you have to understand this. All of that is like seeing God, but it's not really seeing God. Once Jesus comes, it's like no one's actually seen God. It takes Jesus, who's in the closest relationship with the Father, uh, it, he's the one who makes him known. So I pointed out before this last phrase here, the Greek is exegeo, exegeo, Jesus exegeo. What does that mean? Uh, Exegeo is the Greek word from which we get exegete. We talk about exegeting scripture. Pastors sometimes are exegetical teachers. This is an exegetical sermon taking a passage of scripture like Psalm 22, which we're about to do and walking through that. Right now, I am exegeting John 1.18. And in John 1.18, we learn that Jesus exegetes God. It means to explain so you understand. To explain so you understand. Jesus exegetes God. So one thing we can all agree on, even though there are great Christians, by the way, I have known thoughtful, biblically studious Christians who have held all of those different theories that we looked at. One thing we can know is that whatever is going on in the Old Testament, we do not see God's heart. We do not see the essence. We don't even really see God until we stare into the face of Christ. That we do. Jesus himself says the same thing in John 6, 46. He says it again later on, John 14, if you see me, you're seeing the Father. 
And so we start there and say that is God's heart. And that, uh, that is what we're gonna see today in Psalm 22. It's reemphasized in the Old Covenant. So I want you to turn there with me, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and you can bring me back to this during Q&A if you want to, we'll have time for that in a few minutes. Psalm 22, <clears throat> where we see the heart of Christ. While, while you're opening up in your Bible, Psalm 22, let me mention a couple things. We do have visitor Bibles across all of our sites, and so if you, if you want one, at some of our sites, they're down by the front, and at other sites, ushers will hand them out. I think in Oakville, we're handing them out. Just raise your hand, and, uh, and an usher will bring you one if you don't have a Bible with you. Um, again, at other sites, you, you, it's self-serve. You get your own, and also, it's a fine time for you to look on with someone close by if you wanna do that. Meet somebody in your aisle, follow along. Psalm 22 is where we're headed. We also have the Meeting House app that you can download download, track with both sermon notes and scripture. <clears throat> also, I'll mention this while we're doing that, just to close the loop on some things, we, we, um, we had our in-seat survey a few weeks ago. We also had our home church tours where we go around to a home church and we get feedback from you guys on how we're doing. And for anyone who is interested to track with those year after year, themeetinghouse.com slash survey says. The meetinghouse.com slash survey says is an opportunity to close that loop. I'll mention a couple other things. Our AIDS care kits and care cards we raise money for. We have a history of doing this financially and in different areas. We set a bar very high and then we never make our goal but we accomplish amazing things in the process. Uh, that's also the case this time. Our goal was 750 care kits and 2300 care cards. And we got 645 care kits for Zimbabwe. We got uh, 2,036 care cards for Mennonite Central Committee. By the way, each care card is a $100 donation. $100, we got over 2,000 of those. That's like, um, <laughs> that's like a lot of money, I think. I'm not sure what, but I think it's a lot. I just, so I, we wanna say thank you to you guys for giving so generously. And by the way, we, we were able also to, to fill in the gap and up that to the full amount that we were when it comes to finances from uh, extra that we had in our compassion fund because you guys give so generously to compassion. So thank you so much, this is wonderful. Appreciate your generosity. And this is just a part of who we are. You guys give so well and uh, we're so grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> All right, let's, oh, well, I mean, no, can I mention a couple other things? The theology after party, or just the after party as we've been calling it, we kicked it off last week. We had a full house for this party. I guess that's what a party looks like when you're a bunch of Bible nerds. <laughs> Rock on, you party animals. So theology after party, uh, had a great kickoff last week. The podcast is available. Also, uh, I'll mention that tonight, that's in Oakville time, there is the one week in the series where we will not have uh, theology after party, just the building was previously booked, uh, but we will for every other night. Um, it, so it resumes again on uh, the 17th of April, April 17th, which will be today for those of you at regional sites. April 17th, the theology after party resumes. One last thing, uh, thinking of all the uh, money that we have raised and the investment in Mennonite Central Committee, World Vision, Brethren in Christ overseas in the southern countries of Africa, I haven't had a chance to be over to see and to learn what we're doing and to partner with them. And so in about a month's time, I'm gonna get to go to Africa. And I'm excited about that. And it's fi finally a chance to be able to partner with them, learn with them. I'm gonna be over teaching for a few days at a, a peace uh, school to, um, in southern Africa. Uh, to teach theology of reconciliation, but while I'm teaching some theological principles, I'm gonna be there to learn and to study and hopefully grow and to see the work that they have done and be blessed by that and be able to come back a little richer for it. Have an opportunity to go to Zambia where, I don't know if you know Nina, my wife lived in Zambia for a year before we were married and worked there in compassion work um, as, a, as a public health nurse and um, so she's gonna come with me and we'll be back in our own stomping grounds and we're gonna take Maya, our daughter, with us. So that's coming up in a month and we're pretty excited about that. You'll hear more about that in weeks ahead. All right, Psalm 22. <laughs> Let's dive in. <clears throat> Psalm 22 starts with a pretty familiar sentence, doesn't it? My God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, Jesus utters the exact same words from the cross. And 
it raises the question for some people, was Jesus actually forsaken by God in that moment? Was Jesus feeling forsaken so he was uttering it? Is he just quoting the Psalms? What, why did that come out of Christ's mouth? Certainly David feels this. I think there may be a clue as we look at verse 24 in Psalm 22. In verse 24, and we see this throughout the Psalm, David is progressive, he starts off bleak. God, you've forsaken me. I don't know why, but you're not here. And then he starts to push his way towards saying things like this in verse 24. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And so we see a development in the Psalm where David is actually able to work his way towards saying, I may feel at times like you have forsaken me, but the, tr- the reality is y- you haven't. And, and I, I wanna just say that this may be the experience some of you are having and the journey some of you are taking. You may be at a place in your life now or you can remember a time in your life when you were saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whether you use those words or not, that was your heart cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you right now? And, and I understand that happens and sometimes you feel like, when I need God most, why does he disappear then? But it seems to be the message of Psalm 22 that it is the nature of intense suffering and deep hurt to actually cripple us in a variety of ways, and one of those ways is our ability to sense God's love for us. So that feeling of my prayers are just hitting a ceiling, God seems to have abandoned me when I need him most, that feeling is not tuning you into reality, that's pain that is dismantling your spiritual antenna. You know, if we have kind of spiritual antenna that sense God's presence, they're broken. They get broken off through pain, through suffering, through abuse, through very difficult times. And David's journey here is a great reminder of us that we can start with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we, you can get to the point of saying, actually, you were there all along. You've never hidden your face from me. My sense of your distance is not because you are distanced, it's not saying something about you, it's saying something about me. That's how broken I am right now. And I want to encourage you, this is the journey, I understand, of how you feel. It's the journey of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, he can't even call him Father. He's, the distance, the sense of distance is so great. That means when you pray to God, you're praying to a God who understands even what it's like to feel like God is distant. I mean, he gets, he gets the human experience. He knows what it's like to call out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, the whole journey happens on the cross just like as it does here in Psalm 22. By the end of his time of suffering on the cross, what does Jesus say? Luke records his last words as being, Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Be encouraged. God is with you and he loves you, even if you're not sensing that. Let me point out a few other verses here from, verse, uh, from chapter 22 of the Psalms, and you're gonna work your way through the whole Psalm in home church. Look at verse six. Verse six and onward, he says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. Uh, by the way, I am a worm and not a man. Verses like this always just remind me to put a plug into, uh, p- put a plug in for not using silly talk when we talk about taking the Bible literally. Uh, it's a dumb way of talking about any body of literature. Do you take the Bible literally is a stupid question, but it's a stupid question because we we ask it and we promote it. You gotta believe in the literal word of God. What does that mean? People use metaphor. And then there's whole books that are poetry and lyric and apocalyptic literature. So even within the genre of history, metaphor gets used. David says, I am a worm and not a man. And we say, get out, who turned you into a worm? (laughs) No way, I don't believe that actually happened. Therefore, this can't be true. And we create all kinds of weird debates. I think we say the word literally when we really mean really, really. I believe the Bible's really, really true. And we don't know what word to use to emphasize that. So we say literally, it's literally true. And that just creates a lot of weirdness. Don't be weird. (laughs) All who see me mock me, verse seven. They, They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. By the way, it's the exact same things they were saying to Jesus while he was hanging on the cross. 
You, you say you're the Messiah, God's anointed, why don't you let God rescue you? Come on down, maybe we're doing you a favor by crucifying you because we're giving you an opportunity to show that God's on your side. You can bust out of there like muscle man Jesus and then come down and slay all your enemies. Go ahead, let's see you use your power because it seems like you're abandoned by God, but of course you want to prove us different. Don't, oh, you're not, well look at that. I guess God really has abandoned you. That's the opinion of the enemies. Yet, verse nine, you brought me out of the womb and you made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me for trouble is near and there is no, no one to help. Verse 12, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. Verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint and my heart is turned to wax that has melted within me. Extreme suffering, deep pain. And I think it's also interesting, he says all my bones are out of joint. He mentions his bones, but they're not broken, they're out of joint, which uh, is interesting because John points out specifically that Christ's bones were not broken even though that was common in crucifixion. His bones were not broken making the parallel to the Passover, because the Passover lamb was not to have any of its bones broken. First Corinthians five, the apostle Paul says, Jesus was our Passover lamb. And even in his dying, his bones may have been ripped apart, but they were not broken. And he points that out here, my bones are out of joint, heart has turned to wax and just melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot sherd. That's a great name, pot sherd. We, we don't talk about pot sherds enough, I think. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Okay, what's with that? I don't know within the life of David where he actually gets his hands and fierce feet pierced or his fierce peep peeped. Uh, if, what, even within this context, if they're just hunting him down, Saul and his army, whoever is chasing David and hates David, and then they just poke holes in his hands and his feet, it is, it is as though as David is describing his own pain and his own suffering, he starts, and here I'm gonna use a new age phrase that actually applies here. It's as though David, out of his own suffering and his own experience, he starts to channel Jesus. He starts to speak the heart of Christ in his own suffering. It's like he begins to, to tune in to occurrences that won't happen for hundreds and hundreds of years. They pierced my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. The people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my garments. For my garments, This is all the crucifixion of Christ, exactly what was happening. He's naked, he's placed on, dis on display while they gamble for his clothes while he hangs there with pierced hands and feet. There's so one other passage really grabs me with this kind of graphic imagery, it's from the prophet Zechariah. I was reading Zechariah this week and was just blown away at the different imagery of the coming of Christ where I think again, you have this kind of tuning into the stream of time that begins to pull the future back into these moments when, when they are speaking about their own experience but it becomes prophetic. Zechariah is a prophet so he speaks more on behalf of God and Zechariah says this, and this is Yahweh talking through the prophet Zechariah. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. How beautiful, God's gonna pour out his spirit, his spirit of grace. And he goes on to say, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. What? And they will mourn for him. Hold on a second. Me or him? Who are you talking about here? This is just grammatically confusing but it's theologically brilliant. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. This is Yahweh being pierced and Yahweh then being mourned for as a him, as a son. There are some of these highlight passages in the Old Testament that are just mind-boggling. 
and how they tie to Christ. And David is doing that now here in Psalm 22. Let me let me say one more thing, and then we're throw it open to Q and A. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. David sees here that ultimately where is this headed? Through this experience of being kind of naked and laid bare, dying a, a, a torturous death, having your hands and your feet pierced, it's heading somewhere, it's, it's heading to all of the nations being blessed and being gathered together. There's something about this that is tied into the vision of this is not just for Israel, it is a gathering in of everyone, Jew and Gentile together. And of course, that's exactly what, what the mission of Jesus was all about. Okay, let's start opening Q&A. Do we have someone who has a question? Just raise your hand, and we have runners with a mic. I see a hand over there. I see one back there. We may have time to just get to one. While you're going, let me see if someone sent in a text question. Okay, Steve says, why then does God use something like violence to accommodate humanity when Jesus, who is also God, Jesus, well, Jesus' mantra is no violence. Why does God, Jesus, allow violence at all if he's so against it? No, that's wonderful, Steve, and it, it, it is the question, and our, our best answer, or no, not our best answer, it's one of the answers, you can decide what the best answer is, one of the answers is that God uses even things he's against to still accomplish his will. It's what we seem to see a pattern of in scripture. But just because God uses something then doesn't mean that we can turn to any page of the Bible and says, well, God's violent here, so we might as well stand for war. Any more than we should say, well, God likes animal sacrifice, so I should go kill my dog. I mean, killing your cat's another issue, but don't kill your dog. No, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Right? We just, we, so we, we say ultimately, we are Christians, followers of Christ. We are not Bibleians, and we're not even Godians in general. We are Christians. We follow the God who is seen through Christ. Great, great question. Who, else, who has the mic? Just go ahead, right ahead. Uh, Bruxy, I'm trying to understand this principle of accommodation. Yes. Is God forced to choose the lesser of two evils because of our choices? Is that what, what's going on here? I would say God is not forced to do anything, but he chooses to choose, yes. Is the temple God's primary will? No, it is not. But God chooses it and uses it and doesn't pout about it. Are kings of Israel God's primary will? No, it's personal rejection of God. But he chooses it and uses it and doesn't pout about it. I think the same is true for the sacrificial system. It may also be true about violence in the Old Testament. His hand is never forced. It's his choice from start to finish. It's great, thank you. There's one more hand over there. We're almost out of time. If you can ask a quick question, I will give you a quick answer, and both will probably be inadequate, but it'll be fun. Let's go. <laughs> how, do we, uh, how do we help other Christians to see God as r- relational, but not should be, although Jesus and the Father and the, and the Spirit are all distinct, but there's a highly relational element to them, uh, yes. which I find that we talk about tr- the Trinity more of a theory more than reality. Mm. So how do we help people How do see we that? help Is people... It- how do we help other Christians to really appreciate the fact that God's a re- really a relational being at his core? That's who he is. Uh, that's good, you're right. And I guess we need to both uh, teach it directly and then live it out. And, and it's true that I think it's, a, it's woefully underrepresented in our teaching, and I'm guilty of that as well. And so it, it's actually an area where, if you've been at the Meeting House any, any, for even just the last number of months, you have heard me up my game on that specifically that it is not just a matter of having the Holy Spirit inside us or God inside us, but it is the love shared among the Trinity themselves that we are called into and planted within us. You've heard that, com- that talk come out of me a lot more last few months, and I believe that it's a, an un- underrepresented area of who God is that needs to be taught more from the front, that then experienced and lived out so it just begins to ooze out of us in our life. Uh, working on a book right now about the gospel and, in, and, it's, and I have a chapter on that, whereas 10 years ago I might not have included that chapter, it just wasn't an area of emphasis and, and so I think that many of us are growing more in that direction. So we wanna talk about it and we also just wanna live it out. And in the end, there are just gonna be Christians at other churches who don't agree with us on a bunch of this stuff. They're still our brothers and sisters and we can learn a lot from them and we wish them well. Even though they're heretics. <laughs> no, not really, not really. We love them. We love them. All right, take out. 
Let's make it practical, folks. We've been in Psalm 22, we've been seeing that the suffering of David represents the suffering of Christ, and that in that there can be hope even when we don't sense it. We can move from my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, to uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. We, we can take that journey, and we can, in all of it, understand that Christ is at the center of us understanding God, and we see that clearly in Psalm 22. Christ, Christ's way is a way of suffering love. Uh, we can put it this way. Jesus is our example. Sounds really basic, but you understand that there, for many long periods of the Christian church, they would say God in general is our example, therefore whatever God does on any page of the Bible is something we can do. You know, witch burning comes from the Bible. The Bible talks, killing death penalty for theological heresy comes from the Bible. You can kill people because of their beliefs. If you just follow God in general without distilling it down to the clarity of Christ, you can justify some amazing things. And the church has done that for, for too long. And so we don't just say the Bible is our book and God is our example. We say specifically Jesus is our example. We are Christians, not Bibleians, not Godians in general, but Christians. And the crucified king leads us in all the ways of upside down power and cruciform love. Uh, it, all in these ways. And, and because of that, I wanna ask three quick questions. Question one, who should you be serving by laying down your own rights or impulse for self-preservation? And that might be simple as, I tend to spend a lot of money, a lot of stuff on myself. I, I spend money on myself to buy myself stuff, make me feel better about life, make me feel secure, put a buffer between me and those people and make sure some of our spending habits just have to change. A second question, uh, Whose suffering do you need to stop avoiding and instead enter into? For some of us, because of all the stuff and the distractions we have in my life to make me feel better, I don't have to pay attention to the suffering of others instead of entering into that. Or there's that friend I know who's hurting, who is in pain that I should be a part, but you know what, I'm just busy. That's what it is, I'm just really busy and I don't have time to. But the way of Jesus says I'm gonna move toward not away from other suffering. This point stood out to me this week. For me, this is what I need to work on. I thought of a couple of people this week who I'm aware of going through a hard time, haven't really had time, haven't really had time to hang out with them. And just in praying through this earlier this week, I said, wow, boom, this, is, this has gotten to me. I'm gonna be spending time with them and have made those arrangements. So we'll get together this week. This is what God's been saying to me. Next one, what habit, trait, or attitude do you have that opposes the way of Jesus? What habit, trait, or attitude do you have? Now we're getting down to the subtleties, and for some of you, that's where you need to do the battle. Simple habit trait, attitude. It's like, some of us just have an attitude of being more important than we are. I mean, some of us self-deprecate, we think we're nothing. Uh, some of us have the opposite problem. And it just leaks out in little ways. We just come into conversations as though, my opinion is the most important, my jokes are the funniest, pay attention. My stories are the best. You would never even consciously think that, certainly not say it, but it just leaks out in your dominance in social situations. It's just a habit, it's not the way of Christ, that's all. And by the way, it's not about being extrovert versus introvert. Some of us are not leaning into the serving of others in the way of Christ because we're introverts, and we just stay back and say, I am a worm and not a man. <laughs> and so I will sit in the corner and squirm but there are people out there who need love and attention and, and so your introversion holds you back. So there's different ways that we can do this, these habits or these traits. Maybe God is convicting you and saying, I need to actually find everyone I'm talking to extremely valuable, important, and worthy of getting to know and learning from and delighting in. Whatever it may be, there's certainly enough in Psalm 22 and the pattern of Jesus that the Holy Spirit can use to convict us and help us become better more Christ-like. So I wanna close in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to help us be Jesus-shaped. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his suffering love on our behalf. I thank you that you have poured out this spirit of grace and supplication through Christ, through being pierced and mourned for and I thank you that, that you can relate to us, Jesus, as David can relate to us during those, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me times? 
And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are going through those times whose spiritual antenna are broken and who feel like you are distant, that you will help them progress through to a place of, of at least being able to acknowledge that you really do love them and you are close even when they don't feel it. I pray that your spirit will begin to work healing and wholeness. And for those of us who are aware of others around us going through those difficult times, I pray you would motivate us to be agents of healing and those who bring wholeness and help. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to make us more like Jesus, more like Jesus, more like Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We look forward to hanging out with you, learning from you, and walking with you this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us for this week's teaching at The Meeting House. If you want to see more sermons that are associated with this series, then just click up here. If you want to see answers that I offer to questions that you guys send in, then click on here and check out the BBQ. That's Bruxy's bag of questions. And if you want to just see some other cool stuff that we're doing across our sites, then check out this link down here. Well, I'll leave you to it. Go ahead and click away. Just click into your future. To be human is to make choices. Be bold. Click, 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 click. Okay, now this is just getting awkward. I will uh, leave you to it. <laughs>